I'm not going to talk about anything that I research today. In fact, what I want to start with is to kind of let you know how I got here. You see, I had a problem in college. The problem was I didn't know what I wanted to do. I spent uh, five years in school. I went through seven different majors. And the thing that got me, the thing that finally grabbed a hold of me, the thing that made me want to be what I am today was my first class in the Department of Communication after I'd taken a public speaking course. I enjoyed public speaking. I tried almost all of the sciences, and while I was good at them, I didn't want to spend the rest of my life doing them. I gave a shot at English and enjoyed reading Shakespeare and uh, reading uh, fascinating stories, but at the same time, it wasn't what really excited me. And I remember that I walked into my class, and the very first day of class, the professor walked in with a coffee mug. And he looked at all of us and he said, someone tell me what this is. And of course, we answered, it's a coffee mug. And he smiled and he looked at us and said, okay, tell me why. And things got really frustrating really quick. Uh, some, someone offered, because you hold coffee in it. And he smiled and turned the podium on its side and set it on a table and said, fantastic. If I fill this hollow podium full of coffee, it's a coffee mug, right? Someone talked about, well, if it had a handle, and he pulled a handle literally out of a bag with a set of screws and a drill or a, like a screw gun and said, okay, so if I attach this to the podium, then it's a coffee mug, right? And after a few minutes of pondering what would make a coffee mug a coffee mug, he smiled and said, the only thing that makes this thing a coffee mug is that you and I agree that the word mug represents this object and that the word coffee represents the thing we pour into this object. And only through our agreement together do we truly understand our world. That example absolutely blew my mind. Because then he smiled and said, a coffee mug is easy. Now tell me what love means. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about one of those words. One of those words that we throw around all the time, that we use pervasively throughout our society, um, but I want to look at it in a different way. And the way that I want to look at it is this, is that how we talk about our world fundamentally structures its reality. That love is how we collectively talk about love as a public how we talk about justice and equality fundamentally shape our understanding of those things. And so the word I want to throw out to you today and, and, and have you ponder on for just a second is a word that we love to use all the time. It's one of the most utilized words in our modern vernacular. It's the word leadership. It's over the subject of over 15,000 books. Uh, there are thousands of written articles written about it every year in a variety of scholarly and popular press journals and magazines. Colleges and universities have programs to teach it. We talk about it um, in everything from politics to high school classrooms. In fact, there have been over 300 TED Talks specifically on the subject of leadership. But what is it? What is the reality of leadership as we've constructed it symbolically? Lots of people have had things to say on the subject. Uh, I just found a few definitions that I thought might be interesting. Uh, Peter Druck Drucker, the Austrian management consultant and 2002 Presidential Medal of Freedom winner, said that the only definition of a leader is someone who has followers. Warren Bennis, the American scholar and organizational consultant, said that leadership is the capacity to translate vision into reality. John Maxwell, the ordained minister and leadership and management author, said that leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. Hans Vestberg, the CEO of Verizon, defined leadership as ensuring that people have everything they need to achieve the missions of an organization and that everything else is simply footnotes. 
Gary Eukel, the professor emeritus from the University of Albany, who's an industrial organizational psychologist, said that the process of influencing others to understand and agree about what needs to be done and how to do it, and the process of facilitating a group of individuals to achieve a common goal, that's leadership. George McGregor Burns, one of the, uh, what some consider one of the utmost experts on the subject of leadership, a Pulitzer Prize winner for history, um, Define leadership as leaders and followers raising one another to higher levels of morality and motivation. Kevin Cruz, the founder and CEO of LeadX, the online leadership learning pro, uh, platform, uh, trust across America's top thought leader on leadership. Define leadership as a process of social influence which maximizes the effort of others towards the achievement of a common goal. James Cruz's and Barry Posner, business professors uh, and the uh, Levy School of Business define leadership as the art of mobilizing others to want to struggle for shared aspirations. Now, if you listen to those definitions, uh, none of them sound the same. They're all vastly different. In fact, they're so different that in 2006, a, a group of well-known and respected scholars attempted to establish what they defined as a general theory of leadership. And of their work, Dr. Joanne Ciola said, if the only purpose of their quest was to arrive at a general theory of leadership, then it was a terrific failure. They sometimes agreed on which way to go. They got irritable and lost. They didn't even visit all the areas of leadership studies. Nevertheless, like all great quests, theirs was never really about finding the holy grail of leadership studies. It was about the journey. You see, we can't come to an understanding of this abstract term we call leadership. And yet we talk about it as a public all the time. So much so that while the definitions are vastly different, they do share some commonalities that we begin to attribute to every discussion of what leadership is and how it works. For example, one of the themes that rises to the surface is the notion that leadership is this act that has a defined outcome. That if I act to lead in a particular way, then the outcome will be success. Who's it enacted upon? Well, it's enacted upon the followers or those that work with us. Uh, it presents a particular orientation, right, between the leader and the follower. For it to be enacted upon someone, there has to be someone who acts in the act of leadership and someone upon whom leadership is either um, driven or pushed or sometimes just carefully coaxed. The leader is someone who's responsible then through these, this action for setting vision and shaping the follower, leading them from point A to point B. That makes the leader then the subject of prime importance. They possess the primary agency. They're the ones that have the power and the fulfillment of the leader's goals or vision becomes the definition of leadership success. What then of the follower? Well, the follower is an object. The followers are secondary in the process and they only usually play a part insofar as they help determine the outcome. Now, if we think about this, while this isn't endemic of all definitions of leadership, there are a variety out there. You'll find these facets, these themes, almost every definition of leadership in some shape, form, or fashion. And what I would propose to you today is that's problematic. Given the way that we've constructed it, the way that we commonly talk about it, leadership becomes a problem. Rather than being the center of leadership, the community, the people who follow are often relegated to the sidelines. They're the tools needed to accomplish the goal of the leader. They're the objects to be moved, the obstacles at times that stand in the way as the leader accomplishes their great vision. And while this doesn't necessarily encompass the entirety of our understanding about leadership, or the scholarship that surrounds it, it does serve an example of our public understanding, the reality of how we see and understand leadership together, how we collectively 
talk about it and thereby make it real. Consider the following. I love working at summer camps. And one of the things I always love to do at summer camps was find all the kids that didn't fit in. And I would kind of gather them under my wing. They would be the folks that would sit in the classes that I would teach, or uh, they were the kids that I poured my energy into when it came time for um, athletic events or uh, performances, talent shows, you name it. Those were the folks that I, the, uh, the people upon whom I would try to focus the bulk of my attention. One summer, about six weeks into the camp season, Something weird happened to me. I uh, arrived to my classroom one morning to find it filled with the most popular kids at camp. It was three guys and a couple of girls who had made a name for themselves in the past years, had, uh, had become literal fixtures of the camp, had made themselves and made my classroom their home for the summer or at least for that week. And the rest of the students in the class didn't really know what to do with them. We spent time, we hung out the first day, we all got to know each other a little bit as you do in that first awkward day of camp. And it came time for lunch. When we went to lunch and we all sat down, I looked as one of the guys who's the college quarterback of a a big name high school in my state, and another one of the guys who was the most desired young man at camp began to notice a, a young man who was sitting at the far end of the table by himself. And they elbowed one another, and the football player stands up and he begins to work his way down the table. And I thought to myself, as I looked at the young man at the end of the table, I'm going to have to intervene here. There was something about the way they looked at each other the smile on his face as he moved toward the end of the table and he reached down and he picked up the young man's tray and began to walk off with it. The young man in a, a moment of panic rose up to say something. I began to move from the wall to intervene as this other gentleman walked over and wrapped his arm around the young man and said to him, you're going to sit with us for the rest of the week. And the next thing I know, as I look around, this small group of men and women collected unto themselves every kid that didn't fit into camp that week. They made a point of going and finding the folks that sat alone or uh, felt rejected, kids that uh, failed fantastically on the sports uh, fields. They made a point of going to and saying, hey, it's going to be all right. Let me show you what to do. Those folks that uh, they encountered in other aspects of camp. They drew unto them until my classroom became the five most popular kids at camp that did the best they could not to be popular at all. And instead, they spent their time pouring into the young people they had gathered with them. And by the time the end of the week arrived, there was an event we called Mega Relay. There's this string of events that uh, you string together relay races, doing all kinds of insane and crazy things. And the kids that would normally not be the ones to win the mega relay were cheered on and absolutely destroyed all comers on. I watched as some of the kids who would never have been the center of attention were hoisted onto the shoulders of some of their colleagues, hoisted on the shoulders of some of the people that they looked to as inspiration, as those people cheered their names and carried them through camp. And at the end of the week, I pulled that small group of kids together and I said, tell me something. Why? And one of the guys, uh, we'll call him Will for the sake of this talk. Will looked over at me and said, I've had my time in the spotlight. I thought it was maybe their time to have his time in the spotlight. And that's one good thing I'm good at, is drawing attention to myself. So I figured if people were looking at me, they'd look at him, and then he could shine. 
You see, one of the things those kids weren't worried about, they weren't worried about themselves. They weren't worried about being in charge. They weren't worried about their vision, their focus, their outcomes. They were concerned about everyone else around them, about raising the level of not just consciousness, but concern, uh, compassion for the people around them. They didn't have a set goal or vision besides seeing those who went unseen and giving a voice to those who didn't have a voice. And by the time the week closed, working together with those young people, they accomplished some amazing things. You see, we're living in an interesting time. We're hearing the voices of many around us who yearn to be heard. We're living in a time when we hunger to be part of a community again. We've been trapped behind screens, many of us, for an entire year, and it would be nice to just see faces again. We have an opportunity today to do something that we may never have had to in the last two, three, four generations, and that's to begin a brand new conversation, one that potentially changes the way, again, because language structures the real, changes the way that people see and understand what it means to be a leader. Because maybe, just maybe, leadership isn't always about vision and goals or techniques or even success. Think with me for just a second about what leadership might look like if we thought about it as a community of people committed to one another, who in humility step forward when they need to to help the others around them and step back when someone else's knowledge or talent or passion made them the ideal person to move the conversation forward. If only they had the voice. Before we can get there, it's time for us to change the way we talk about leadership. It's time for us to redefine collectively how we lead. It is first, a matter of language. And after that, it's a matter of how we work together to challenge others to talk and with it think about what leadership might be. But what might that change look like? Father Gregory Boyle, a man who shared the TED stage, founded Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, one of the largest rehabilitation programs for young men and women who are bound up in the life of gangs in Los Angeles. When asked to speak at his alma mater, he said that when the students should leave, they should go from that place to stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. They should stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. We should stand with those whose dignity has been denied to stand with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless so that we can make those voices heard. The challenge I have for you today is maybe we should think differently about our conversation about leadership and with it begin crafting a new reality. Maybe leadership isn't about high, how high we climb, how much we succeed, Maybe leadership is just about the people, the community, and with whom we stand. So start a new conversation today. Thank you.